ladies and gentlemen. Please silence your phones and hush your babies. The show is about to start. Hi everyone. We've got some waving of little British flags going on here because the Britvengers are here to you to talk about something very British, which is the new Apostle. Look at this, these beautiful colours. Same colours as the American flag, but arranged correctly. And now that I've lost half my viewers, I will bring in uh, Peter and Jane to help me discuss. We don't need those people. <laughs> well, I definitely do. 70% of my audience is, is American. If they all disappeared, I'd have nothing left. <laughs> So uh, we, we love you, our American cousins. Uh, but we are here to talk about the first British apostle since 1911. Since James E. Talmadge, okay. author of Jesus the Christ um, and Articles of Faith and other such seminal works. Um, yeah, Jackson Rowley said those are fighting words, bro. Um, indeed they are. <laughs> Indeed, they are. There, there are regular commenters on these videos that um, thank me for, for you know, not being mean to the Americans, and and I feel like I failed every time I see that because if I'm not mean to you, who else will keep you in check, huh? Right. Well, as Sorsha just commented, insults are how we show affection. Insults are we how we show affection. Um, exactly. Us Americans. Another comment. <laughs> us Americans will tolerate uh, you Brits, but only because you do such work. Why do most Brits have a chip on their shoulder about America? Most Americans can care less about the UK. Well, if you can care less about the UK, that means you care about us somewhat, does it not? So um, I thought the expression See, was you got your grammar care out. Less. That's the point. <laughs> Americans, you tell them. They keep colonizing <laughs> us too. I, I feel your pain. You give them help, people. <laughs> this is, give them help. There's a Scottish person sat in the corner. Just, just, yeah. But look, it's got your flag on it. I look. didn't understand any of that, look. the accent. Look, it's got a little salt <laughs> in the background, hasn't it? Look, it's got the Scottish flag. It does. It incorporates. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, now that I've, I've successfully upset many, many people, um, let's talk about the latest apostle, shall we? Patrick Kieran. Oh, so dishy. Eat. Oh. Someone said something about him looking like James Bond, Four. right? Yeah, Chloe, oh, yes. the, the James Bond esque pick. Yes. And yeah. I think I think I that's like fair. I like that image. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a, he's looks tasty. Yeah, yeah. But I think I think the the fans of Uckdorf are pleased with the aesthetics of the new apostles. Should we say that? Well, can you imagine with the with the um, James Bond imagery? We I can I'm now thinking about him just sort of like uh, throwing the door open to the SCMC and just spinning his hat, and it just lands <laughs> perfectly and <laughs> winking at the secretary. And yeah, yeah. I, we're oh, you know he this. winks well at people Chloe. all around the church office building, right? He gives people the cheeky wink all around. Yeah. All around, yeah. all around, because he's a suave man. Yeah, good. Uh, Paul Chloe, well done. That's sticking. I didn't realise this was going to be quite such a such a loving for Patrick Kieran. Um, no, we're in, we'll the, get... we're in the gutter already. Uncle Booker's fighting <laughs> Let's back call hard. Out and be serious. Uncle Booker's fighting back hard. <laughs> he has better looking teeth than ninety nine percent of the UK population. I'll give you that. You're not wrong. I'll, I'll give you this that. True. We're not arguing yeah. with that. It's, no, it's, no. Yeah. It's, it's totally, totally fair. True points. Okay, right. So he <laughs> was born. Patrick Robert David Kieran was born on July in July 1951. Don't have an exact date of birth. Uh, I'm sure I could find it. But isn't that interesting? He goes by Patrick Kieran everywhere. He he doesn't go by any middle initial. Got rid of that. But. He is actually Patrick R. D. Kieran, so that's what I shall now be referring to him as uh, from now on. There's a David in there. I've been researching yeah. all day. Abraham Patrick Gilead Robert David Kieran. stuff about the Davidic servant, and uh, so he's a candidate. He, you know, it's going to be David Bednar or him is mm -hmm. going to be the Messiah. I'm going oh, okay. with the Brit. <laughs> Well, the, 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 we found this out from the church. The church showed it. When he became president of Bristol, England Stake in 1997, he was Patrick Robert David Kieran, age 36. 
Um, yeah, quite a young state president, actually, right? At just 36 years old, tender mm. age. That is young, yeah. 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 Uh, who was the yeah, last apostle without an initial? From. Someone said, who was the last apostle without initial? Ulysses Suarez. Doesn't ha doesn't use a middle initial. I haven't checked to see if he has one, but he doesn't use one. So um, it might be that we're moving towards or we're phasing out the middle initial shtick to try and make them sound more human and approachable, perhaps. What are your thoughts? <laughs> um, some some of them might care. I mean, Uke's always <laughs> I... going about being normal and approachable to the missionaries. So, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I just be. always yeah, assumed it was himself. an American thing. Like, uh, you know, when it when the you know people who use the first initial because they mm -hmm. prefer to use their middle name and or 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 you've been named with an initial. Awesome. It's I mm -hmm. I don't know anyone in, who does that. Is that is, is is that an American thing? I don't know what is the it's it's, it's a bit weird. Thing. I mm. well, you know, uh, you know, it it's just a bit. Odd. We don't tend to do that here, do we? Or do we? No. Or, well, have I just not observed it? I don't think we do. It's not a thing here. No. Mark Johnson's throwing out that Martin Turvey is Mormon royalty from the Southwest because Martin Turvey was one of his counselors, age 37, a group marketing manager for PBTI. Um, yeah. We don't like Martin Turvey on this channel because he called a new stake president inadequate on the stand in front of the entire stake. So um, he was probably trying to make a joke. No excuse. It just wasn't a very nice thing to say, so we don't we don't like him too much. Um, I, on the other hand, so mentioned love him. Oh. So because maybe oh. he was right, maybe maybe he was. <laughs> maybe the first man question was a complete idea. No, I'm just teasing. Mm. But uh, yeah, his I think his work has been exemplary, and yeah, he he unfortunately there there was a poor choice of words from the stand. But yeah, Turvey. I love you, even if they don't. They're just grumpy. Well, yeah, that's that's us. Uh, I'm just fact-checking the date he was born. 1961. Mm. I got that wrong on my slide. Apologies, folks. Um, I got that wrong on my slide. It wasn't 1951, it's 1961. Thank you very much for people pointing that out in the chat. See, this is how we learn and grow. Mistakes are made. <laughs> Mistakes are corrected. All is well. So someone was uh, saying he much. went to boarding school or private school when he was eight um so he had so uh, yes he did quite um, but age, his dad was, was in, in the yeah. air force i believe which yeah i don't know whether so that was um, an unusual that gets paid for by the services to have your children go to boarding school um i know it can yeah. be often so i don't think it's necessarily a sign of his wealth he did become wealthy and we'll get to that later um but i don't know whether he's from a particularly posh family um, certainly not very poor family. His dad was working a decent job, but yeah, I know D mm. Jane, you're cringing. Yeah. <laughs> He's a posh boy. Whichever, whichever way we dress up. If your kid went to boarding school, you're a posh boy. And he said, he, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's just. Oh, hello. Hang on. <laughs> Gemma, whoa, 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 whoa. Gemma, Gemma Husser just threw uh, a, a lovely little donation. Thank you very much. To tell us that Patrick's a good egg held his hand uh, in the prayer circle. Oh. So these are the sorts of claims to fame that are coming out of the British Isles now. Um, thank you very much, Gemma, for your, for your kind donation <laughs> to the channel. Um, so yes, thank you, Kaz. Uh, 18th of July, 1961. Um, I must have hit five instead of six. These things happen. Uh, but, you know, let's just hope I got his wife's date of birth right. I think I did. I must. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so Patrick Kieran is the first apostle to be born in the 60s, um, which is very interesting. Um, Wanda Anthony is saying, wow, I'm older than one of the apostles now. Time marches on. <laughs> Which is just I'm having a slight existential crisis now that one day I will be older than it. It's like that first time you realize you're older than the missionaries that are coming out and serving and you start to yeah. feel a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Widwife, thank you very much for your donation. Left by then, Nemo. I wouldn't worry. No, that's fair. Right. So should we move on? Or it'll Patrick be you. Kieran was introduced to the church in Laguna, California, 1985. Um, yeah. 
keep that date in mind, 1985. That's when he moved to California. He stayed with a Mormon family out in California for a couple of years uh, and was impressed by their spirituality and, and whatnot. That's the story as it goes. So he was 24. Yeah. And he was baptized two years later uh, when he met some missionaries in London once he'd come back from being with them at the age of 26-ish. He was baptized on Christmas. Oh, it would have been 26 by this point in the year. Christmas Eve, uh, 1987. So that's fine. He was investigator for two years, which is interesting that he's a convert. They, I'm sure they will play on that. I'm sure he'll play on that. That will become a, a crucial part of his origin story. Uh, and then it's said that he met Jennifer Hume in London while she was on an exchange studying uh, the arts and literature, I think, from BYU. She was in London in 1989, and they met at Britannia Ward. So... There we are. Someone's saying when Kieran which, was born, which Russell Nelson one, was 37. Uh, sing, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so Britannia our... for the Americans is is the only uh, single not. members ward it's in not the Britain. Only one. What? There's another no. one. Manchester. Where's the other one? Manchester YSA ward. They have their own building. No. Yeah. I, used, I, I was a, no way. a attendee oh. of the Manchester YSA ward. Yeah. I never knew that. So, yeah, they almost had a Chinese speaking ward there as well because the okay. missionaries that that would serve in Manchester would just stand and take in Chinese students. Mm. Uh, but that's a topic for another time. So mm. they met in London and they were married two years later in America in a temple in California. Uh, they got married uh, on the 12th of January, 1991. Jennifer Hume was born in Saratoga, California in February, 1971. So she is 10 years younger than... Patrick Kieran. So she's 10 years younger than him, which is fine. That only becomes interesting when you read this comment on Reddit. Now, massive pinch of salt. I'm waving my flag to get everyone's attention. Massive pinch of salt on this story. I've only seen it in, in one place. One person has said this. They could be misremembering. They could be... All sorts of things could be wrong with it. I've tried fact-checking it, and I will continue to try and see if I can discover anything about it. But, uh, Jane, could I have you read that, please? I'm sorry. I'm just reeling from the Anthony's comment where he thought they were married in the Scotland Temple. Yeah, funny, <laughs> Anthony. <laughs> very funny. Anthony, this waving of the flag is for you. Well done, Anthony. Right. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, so it says, I was at a small two-day meeting with stake presidents and their wives. Whitney Clayton was presiding and Patrick Heeran accompanied him. As part of their personal introductions, Kieran mentioned how he met his wife. He was flying to California and as he disembarked, he saw the most beautiful young woman he had ever seen. He introduced himself to her and learned she was surprisingly young. Clayton interrupted and laughingly said she was young. Kieran then recounted her mentioning she was a Mormon and only dated Mormons. Somehow he finagled an invitation to her parents' home and met the folks. Chuckling, he recalled they were not impressed their daughter brought home a 10-year-older non-Mormon Englishman. Later, he joined the church. Clayton piped up and said he's sure they were proud of him now. And uh, yeah, he's asking if anyone else has heard this story because okay. he knows that it's different from the published version. Mm -hmm. Because the published version is that they met in London in the late 80s. Um, when she was not, they were married when she was 19. They will have, uh, she was 19 in 1991. Uh, just about she would have turned 20 that year which means they met when she was 17 regardless even in the official story they met when she was 17 but according to if this is true then perhaps they met in 1985 now jennifer hume in 1985 was 14 years old um sorry in in proper mormon speak she was several months shy of her 15th birthday uh, but regardless, she was quite young when they met. And it, it's possible because he was going to Laguna and she was from Saratoga and it's a two hour drive away. Um, so that's, that is what it is. I don't want anyone leaving with this impression that I'm saying that that is what actually happened. Um, but she was around 17 when they, uh, met in the official story possibly younger, according to that one comment on Reddit with a massive pinch of salt to be taken okay uh let's 
um, throw this out there. Oh, someone's saying he had uh, another Mormon girlfriend before he met his wife. Jenna came along later. See, I'm sure these are the sorts of details that will come out. Um, and someone is pointing out that even when she was 17, he was 27. So there was a, there's a big age gap there. Um, could, could I jump? Would you mind if I jump in for just a, yes, a little sure. second? So yeah, Sarah um, from 21st Century Saints and I were talking about this Um during the week and we gave it very very little sort of credibility because you know once or someone says something yeah, on course. reddit and yeah. that mm -hmm. um you know which and obviously it, it may or may not be true um and it's very very common for someone to meet someone when they're quite young this is keep in mind this is the church's heyday especially in the uk everything you know that's good that is happening socially um for young people and young adults in the church it's happening at this time so it's it's kind of for mormons the, the glory days um were this to happen today if um you are older than sort of eight, is it a, a 17 years old as um is, is a complicated age <laughs> where uh, you may potentially uh, come up against possession of trust laws, which is something that we've been trying to sort of educate yeah. church leaders. If someone is in a relationship, you know, if, it's, if you're mm -hmm. young people and there's a few sort of years either side, I mean, that's that's quite normal. Mm -hmm. And th these uh, and possession of trust laws are designed not to cause sort of problems and say we have to micromanage teenage relationships. Mm -hmm. But if someone is 10 years old, older mm -hmm. than the person in question then absolutely this would be flagged as a huge concern and potentially a violation if so, they are in any position of leadership over that young person of possession of trust violation. Can I fact check myself uh, before I get a cease and desist letter from church lawyers or from Patrick Kieran's own personal desk? Um, because uh, his wife was born in February 1971 when they met in 89 it's likely that she will have been 18 unless they met in January uh -huh. when she would have been 17. So let me just, yeah, she was actually probably 18 looking at the exact numbers. Yep. So I don't want to jump ahead there. Uh, so yep. a little bit of self fact checking, but, 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 but there's still the 10 year age gap. He would have been 27 and then he would have turned 28 and in the summer. That's the key piece of information. Yep. I mean, it's the 10 year age gap. gap is a very normal, is, is a very normal thing. Mm -hmm. But as you, you know, if, if you're beginning at that age, what we sort of are trying to focus on in 21st century saints is rather than particular situations, it's just sort of using moments to highlight, look, we're actually focusing on this at the moment. Mm -hmm. And if we see interpersonal relationships happening like, like that, you want to be very, very aware that you, um, because you, you could potentially if this was the case and you were under the age of 18 in a relationship with someone who's much older, the older person could be considered in violation of that possession of trust relationship and end up on a sex offenders register. Even if there is no uh, sexual relationship, if that later develops, it mm -hmm. could be considered grooming. So just uh, to educate you all, um, if you are 10 years older than the person you're checking out and they're very young, you should not be looking at that person. But also, love you, Kieran's. This is absolutely... Absolutely no. Um, like I say, this is all a conversation that has grown out of a Reddit comment that I don't really give a lot of credence yeah. to anyway. Yeah. So uh, if we go with the official story, she was, unless they met in January of that year, she was 18 and he was 27 going on 28 that year. Um, so make of that what you will. Uh, someone here is Anthony. Anthony's in with the comments today saying, I listened to Mormon Land from the Salt Lake Tribune today. So I'm about to get a little bit salty. Um, they speculated that Kieran may be helpful in reversing the Mormon church membership issue in the UK. Well, it's interesting that they would speculate that without talking to any of the British commentators on Mormonism who know what the membership issues are in the UK. Um, <laughs> that would have been helpful if they were going to start speculating about that topic, wouldn't it? Sorry, that's me just getting a little bit salty um, at Patrick Mason. I did um, listen to that and... Um, yeah. I think Patrick <laughs> were quite realistically said it probably won't make much difference. However, he then annoyed me because he went with the narrative that Christianity is declining everywhere in the developed world. Therefore, it's a collective issue. But at which point that is a red flag to me because we're talking about this golden age that we had in the church in the 80s and early 90s where we were booming. The Europe lost its religion in the 20th century. The, this sudden crash of people going to church in America is almost unique. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints grew steadily 
while nearly all the other Christian churches around us emptied dramatically during those decades. So this narrative that the church has to decline along with the rest of Christianity is absolutely false. Now, mm. that's the point where Ruth comes in and says, well, the Internet blew it up and revealed it. None of it's true. Um, but, you know, they, but they, just this idea that, um, that, you know, that is not our story here. Mm -hmm. We this church grew while the other churches collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, they, you know, it was a completely opposite trajectory. Mm -hmm. So now I've I now I've dug myself out of out of any potential legal issues with speculating and making sure I'm getting all the facts right on the name and age and thank you all for being here and watching as we go along through this. Um, we come to 1994 around that time and I want to point out here a lot of this information from now on comes from direct sources, people that knew Patrick here at the time, people on background. I can't necessarily put these links in the description. Where did you find this exactly? There might not be an article on the internet anywhere that I can send you to to say he was president of Clevedon Branch. But I've spoken to people who went to his house while he was president of Clevedon Branch and spent time with him and his wife. So this is the benefit now of being in the UK and being able to talk about all this. Um, and we can work through his story. And there are some really good sources for the, some of the things we're about to tell you. But that's where I want to throw that disclaimer out there now. Um, and there are people that would not come on tonight. Um, various people. I spoke to a, a few people who would not come on tonight. Because by a number of degrees of Kevin Bacon, as it were, by like one or two uh, acquaintances, they know Patrick here directly. Their sister's a really good friend with him or their brother went to the you know uh, was on a bishopric with him or was was on a branch presidency with him or whatever uh, he was never a bishop um so and so knew him while they were x y and z position he affects us here people know him here people have held his hand in the temple here um so you know this is a this is a homegrown issue for us uh, is, is what I want to say. So in, in around 1994, he was president of Clevedon Branch and was well loved by the YSA particularly because he was young, he was a convert. Uh, his wife was particularly young. She was a YSA age herself. Um, you know, so he was a very young branch president in 1994. He's come in towards his 30s. His wife's in her early 20s. Um, they're young, hip, cool. Uh, someone said, join me 20 minutes late and now I'm leaving with a Screaming Eagle and an American flag <laughs> emoji. Thank you, Jacob Schramm. I love you too. Um, so he was president of Clevedon Branch. And then someone else was also a church leader around that time in Bristol Stake. Peter's second favorite person at General Conference. Yay! Christophe, Christophe G Giraud Carrier. Carrier. Yeah. Giraud Carrier. Mm -hmm. Say it over and over again, everyone. I want him to Giraud be the prophet. Carrier. Those two are buddies. Him and Kieran were buddies. Awesome. Um, and so cool. hopefully we might see Carrier brought up into the apostleship as they're trying to diversify because he's French and because he knows Kieran personally from their time together in the trenches in, Bri in Bristol Stake during the 90s. Um, keep an eye out. So, so we're always looking for these markers of nepotism amongst church leaders. Here's one for if Carrier goes any further, and uh, perhaps yeah. even might have had some influence on Carrier's call to the 70. I haven't had a chance to look into that yet, um, and where people, you know, where Kieran was situated at the time that Carrier was being called to the 70. I haven't had a chance to check in on that, but um, I will have a look at it. So, people, Peter, Carrier was the guy who who spoke just before President Nelson's final think celestial debacle at the last conference and Carrier was amazing he did the best talk of the whole conference Sorry, all about good. inclusion lgbtq the whole works um cleverly quoting president nelson himself um at the brief window when he was saying the opposite of what he really believes and absolute genius very brave and and exactly like um patrick kieran you know speaking really powerfully uh, of a Christian Mormonism that's not bigoted and and addressing that head on. So the two of them, I think, are astonishing for compared to what the norm is in the church. Mm -hmm. I'm an absolute fan of both of them. They're, they're going to be amazingly good for the church if they can hold on to that. And Hooked Off did a, for a very long time. 
Can yeah. I throw up a comment from uh, Rodney Huckabee before we go into that? Because I do want to get into that and I want to bring Jane in. Rodney is saying, since the demonstration of the temple penalties ended in 1990 and Kieran didn't go through 1991, I think, when he got married, because he didn't go on a mission, it's likely that he went through when he got married. He may have gone through slightly earlier. Yeah. He may he would have probably would have had to wait at least a year. He would have gone through in 1990. So it's very possible that uh, Rodney's saying here, Elder Kieran will be the first apostle called that did not go through the temple oath penalty pantomime of sitting his own throat, etc. So he would be the first apostle who was endowed after those 1990 changes, which could actually be quite a big deal. Jane, thoughts? Yeah, just just it's it's worthy of no. Um, I have I have no notes. I'm I'm just enjoying the. I, no, do you know what? I'm just going no, to say. Go I'm on. being really mean. Yeah. I, I find it very difficult to care about the, about the CVs of the you know the latest person who's called into Mormon land and um i mean it's 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 of note because um you know he, he's a, a step closer to reality here in in mm-hmm. the uk but i mean he's yay yeah. <laughs> right well then let's move on shall yay. we um because he he might even be yet more relatable to the youngins because while some research was being done looking through the bristol evening post um, Patrick Kieran, aged 36 of Argyle Road, Clevedon, was fined £540 for speeding. Yes, you heard it here monkey. first, folks. You little monkey, Elder <laughs> Kieran. Elder Kieran, um, what I've been told by individuals that knew him, he used to have a convertible sports car or a, or a sports car that used to wear sunglasses and drive around in only on occasion. And it very well may have been one of those occasions where he um <laughs> where he was caught speeding and oh, fined 540 pounds for the privilege um now this is the kind of cv i want the, right? this is how what relatable me. how yeah. relatable and this isn't me going therefore he can't be an apostle blah, 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 blah. none of that this is just normal people so although speeding is moronic crime don't speed. It, it kills is, people. Don't do I it. I agree. Um, but it's also. I think this is the. This is sort of the. You don't get five five hundred forty for doing thirty one in a thirty. Sorry. Right. Go on. Right. Exactly. I, I see. If there is a crime that is to be committed um, <laughs> by Mormon, Mormon, specifically men in the United Mormon Kingdom, this is the one. Bond. I know so. M- yeah. Exactly. Um, it, I know so many um, members of the church here who uh, have got speeding issues. I, I, mm-hmm. There's there's things going on with boys and cars. Um, this it, so it's relatable. I, I guess it's uh, he's he's one mm-hmm. of the guys. He's a yeah. yeah. Chloe Munns is saying yeah. women fast cars. Names Kieran, Patrick Kieran. Right, we got that James Bond vibe coming <laughs> oh, back. Please give us at least an eyebrow raise say in yes. conference, yes. Elder Kieran. So, um, yeah, I just Friday, tenth of July, nineteen ninety-eight, and I, it just came up, and I thought it was interesting to share. Um, it's public knowledge; nothing wrong with sharing it. Um, but make of it what you will. The latest a- apostle to be called um, was fined. Yeah, oh I hope we don't get to be speeding. apostles. Everyone will do this to us. I've never been caught speeding. I'm not. I'm not too worried. Do you know? I'm really hoping that what comes of this discussion is that when he walks into work in his church offices, that they're all like they're all doing James Bond references. That yeah, everyone this, this has got to be because you would, right? Yeah. This, that would be a very British thing to do as well. The but... notes from the SCMC have gone yeah. to all the other the rest of the twelve that when they see him, they're to do this. Exactly. And uh, and and like put fake speeding tickets on his desk and whatnot. Yeah, ask if he um, wants his chilled water shaken or stirred. Yeah, yeah. yeah Mark Johnson saying that seems high for a speeding ticket. It does seem high for a speeding mm-hmm. ticket. Yeah. Especially back then. I don't want to speculate too much because I can't say how quick he was going. But I think I do feel safe in saying that isn't the sort of fine you get for a couple of miles an hour over the limit. Mm. I, d- I don't think that doesn't seem to me what that would be but you know i'm no expert on these he was driving off his bl- newfound mormon repression yeah. Do you th- see i think he's racing to bless a widow 
that's oh. that's that's this is going to be a conference oh, talk one day, and you on, yeah. will all yes. be ashamed of yourselves. Yeah. yeah. Well, I yeah, remember, absolutely. I remember a, a maybe a GA seventy or an Area seventy once at a state conference talking about how they went speeding to a temple dedication, absolutely flying in a sports car, and they're like, "But it was Germany, it was the autobahn, so it was legal." And I was like, "Oh yeah, fair enough." Yeah. <laughs> so they were there talking about how like they just floored it because they needed to be somewhere, and uh, it was totally legal because they were on the autobahn, so they could go as quick as they want. Um, so yeah, if I, I if I could be bothered, which I might be bothered, um, I could have a look and see if I could find the legal record of this fine and see if there is any sort of details of like exactly what speed he was doing and and where. But um, oh, someone's going to do that now. Yeah, I have it. Argar Road, Clevedon, Patrick Kieran, age thirty six. It all all the information adds up. Um, that that he was was <laughs> fined for speeding. Um, and there just let's let's just give this context, okay? Because this sounds incredibly mean. Uh, if any if anyone is listening, it Kieran sounds fans, petty, right? Doesn't which it? we are. This is what you would do for yeah. the guy in the office, right? Yeah. This is this is actual what British life is like. If it was one of your mates, you would go just so that you can you can mercilessly drag him throw shade and all in the best possible humor. So mm -hmm. just to clarify, we're doing this because it's bloody funny and we like the guy. Well, yeah, I mean, at a best man speech in the UK, this is the sort of thing someone would yes, dig up. Right. I was at a best man speech once where someone <laughs> had put, they'd found CCTV footage of a time that someone fell over at work and they put that CCTV footage on a projector screen um, for everyone to see because it was quite funny. Uh, Image and Green in the chat is saying normal fine uh, now in today's money is £100 from the UK Gov website. Um, so, and then Anthony Campbell is throwing out his little tidbits of British knowledge here. If he was speeding, it was not on the M25. Hey ho, world's largest car park and all that. Um, cool, there we go. So, I think we've done this to death, but uh, Patrick Bread Mason isn't giving memes. you this kind of commentary, is he? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, let's move on. Because just one year later... Oh, sorry, just... 1997. He was the state president when He's he got caught speeding. <gasps> Ooh, president um... Kieran. <laughs> yeah, because hang on, if we go back... If we go all the way back... Called November 30th, 1997... And then caught speeding. July nineteen ninety eight. So okay, right. He might have been state president, he might not, but it was around that time. So it clearly didn't stop him being called a state president if it did happen before. Um here we are. He becomes president of Bristol, England stake. Nineteen ninety seven, convert in so ten years into his journey into the church, there or thereabouts. Um and he's been married less than that. And he is at the age, tender age of 36, becomes state president. But it might be because he ran Kieran Hume Communications and was a PR man, is a PR man, because brewing around this time uh, was child sex inquiries into the church. Uh, this one from the Bristol Evening Post, that if I look, I believe is 1997. Uh, July 1997, uh, they were starting to look into some worrisome uh, child, allegations of child sexual abuse within the Mormon Church in Bristol. Uh, this was the, this is the Bristol Evening Post from that time, and uh, it was front page news. Two police officers were suspended. Um, there's the church spokesperson there is on the screen um, offering the church all the he offering the the press and the media and everyone their full cooperation uh, and the next newspaper says otherwise during uh, in some of this basically the church says we'll fight you legally if you try to get hold of any records um i'll try and put links to all this in the description uh, i'll try and get all that sorted uh, in the am because it's getting quite late here but you can see it on screen yourself if you were to pause zoom in have a look uh, let me see if i can make that full screen there you go uh, you can see that in 1999, 
so 97 to 99, it was a two-year inquiry. Uh, four men were uh, charged um, for child sexual abuse um, connected to the church. And Patrick Kieran was, a lot of people believe and I can't say this is definitely what happened. Obviously, I don't know the mind of the people that called him, but a lot of people believe he was part of smoothing all this over and using his PR and public relations skills, etc., cetera, uh, to deal with all this. What are your um, thoughts? I, so I, I guess the only thing that I'd like to say at the moment is that um, you just said, Nemo, you, you had alluded to there being sort of issues with transparency and providing information mm-hmm. um, and and the reporting makes it very, very clear. Um, just after we finish up, we're going to go live uh, as 21st Century Saints. Um, and if you pop over to our channel at that point, we are going to be picking up. That little reference is going to be very relevant to what we're going to talk about. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be over there just shortly mm-hmm. and we'll see more about it. So we'll hold off on commenting until yep. a little bit later off. The link is in the description. But anyway, so that's Peter. What are your thoughts to to all this going on? Well, this is, I mean, you know, we, we're kind of joking about his speeding fine, but if that's the worst he did, he was absolutely above the mire going on in his area in the church. And the stories are horrific. And it, and it's not just one or two incidents. Sometimes it's spilled over on the innocent. There was a bishop who turned out to be innocent being, sus- you know, suspected of being an abuser. And that might be one of those articles who turned out not to be, but went through hell with that. But the point was, a lot of them were, and and at some point in that area, and Bristol State covered big chunks of Wales as well, um, eventually though it turned out there was an entire bishopric where all three of the, the bishopric members were paedophiles. Um, you know, the stuff going on across the country, across the church, back when hardly anyone knew even how to begin dealing with abuse in the church and there was still um, you know there wasn't even anything like the training that we have now which is still inadequate um you know it was just horrific and the the awful things that were going on and the inability of the church culture to deal with them effectively or prevent them or you know or be extremely defensive and even today you know we've talked privately with various members of um that region um who say that despite the best efforts of people like patrick kieran to kind of clean up the mess and to minister to victims and so on there's a lot of open wounds still a lot of people who feel that that the right things were not done things were covered up they were not believed um they were never apologized to and responsibility really not taken so I think this is a very powerful context for what we'll get to later with Patrick's sort of barnstorming talk about abuse in General Conference, which was an absolute game changer and the reason he is one of my heroes. Um, but that didn't come out of nowhere. This came out of years of experience at, at on the ground dealing with the church's calamitous um, failures around abuse by its members and clergy. Um, so it, you know, he was speaking from a place of a lot of pain and having spoken to a lot of victims in his own ministry, and the universal message, almost universal. I don't, I don't, I've not heard anyone say anything other than Patrick Kieran has been an absolutely exemplary minister. He has taken time. He spent. He's visited the ill, like gone the extra mile, extraordinarily. My sister was. Um, living for a while in Bristol stake and, and he was her state president um, and her and all the other people have been sort of recollecting their experiences with him are saying that he and his wife were absolutely fantastic they particularly were very good at supporting young adults um, and welcoming them into their home um, and, you know he just absolutely does seem to be one of these good guys and for me personally this this is why I keep bothering with trying to save the church or have it save itself. Um, the reason I think it is worth saving is there is this parallel religion going on. There are not just real Christians in Mormonism who really get it and they're, they're, all of their intentions are the right ones and they often do a lot of good. 
despite the system being quite dysfunctional and, and at times making them do can bad. I, can I get Jane um, in? But, for but, there, are also, but there are also leaders. <laughs> oh, yeah. There are people like... <laughs> There are leaders, and obviously he's been enough of a yes man to get to this position. So we're not, you know, we're not pretending he's some amazing rebel or he'd never have been ordained. Um, but he's walking a very difficult path, as all the people like him do. Um, we do have people who could do staggeringly better at running this church as general authorities than most of the ones we've got. They are replaceable, and members are kind of given this idea that if you replace them who would you replace them with they are the best we've got they're not the <clears> best <throat> we've got people like patrick kieran are significantly peter i'm gonna have to ask you to pretty much all the other apostles give way to jane in the parliamentary term thank you bless jane, you please. i appreciate it. i shall take the floor um it's really important <laughs> because i can actually you know i can actually feel the spirit of sarah delaney beside me um my co-host mm -hmm. who uh, yeah uh, saying the, the probably something similar to this um the context at this time is very very important institutionally throughout um specifically we're talking about the uk uh, countries all over the world have got their own systemic problems going on that people in those countries will understand it here. There is a particular time when um, abuse can be exploited. Um, it can occur on a scale that is so off the charts. It is incredible and uh, massive institutions, churches, organizations, football clubs, we're all dealing with this. This is what I would suggest respectfully is typical of any religious organisation you care to pick in the United Kingdom that have got issues around power dynamics, any sporting organisation, uh, the, the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC or National Media Services, Parliament, uh, schools. And all of these inquiries are still starting today. They were not handled well. And so this is the period of time that we're learning lessons about. Now, sometimes we can look at a PR agency coming in and sort of what, what we are really talking about here is, did he come in and whitewash the church? And it, it's a way to look at PR companies. What PR companies have learned very, very, um, what they've been trying to advise and get across for um, anyone who's good at their job in that industry um, makes it clear you have to properly look and investigate what the problem is. You have to take clear accountability. You have to apologize and you have to make clear statements around, um, around liability. And that is probably what he's been part of having those conversations now when we're uh, what was being suggested there um was that uh he's he's spoken with or worked with a tremendous amount of um abuse victims specifically from the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints at this time now i don't believe there's any evidence to support that whatsoever i don't what i can tell you and the the numbers at the time because those would have been current cases would have been in the context probably quite low so we're probably talking single figures it would have involved multiple um it would have involved multiple individuals but it is not the church's job nor a PR company's job to investigate it, you cannot be doing that. It gets in the way of the legal process. There's reasons why the church has to stand the hell back and it, lawyers too, and let the authorities do the job of investigating. I can tell you right now that in the space of the, the six months long um, a, 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 a survey on abuse in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have, as 21st century saints, we've spoken to more victims in six months than Patrick is likely to have had in his entire career. Because when it comes to looking at abuse, you have to really be engaging with victims. And he hasn't had a role that has either required him to do that or would be appropriate for him to do that a hell of a lot of damage would be caused if Elder Kieran was having those types of conversations across the board so uh, you know I would suggest that he has expertise and experience from being aware of this case certainly conversations will have been had he's clearly learned a great deal and he, most importantly he's clearly listened as for the kind of man he is and this is my final point on this um it doesn't 
bloody matter. So what I'm really aware of is, to, you know, I think in a lot of ways tonight is an Elder Kieran love fest because mm -hmm. he is so well loved. He is so popular. People have only nice things to say about them. What we find with whether it's someone who's an abuser, whether it's someone who's committed a crime, whether it's someone who's we have to make sort of saints or villains of people. And when to our great surprise, we find out that someone was speeding or someone had an affair or someone. I'm gonna, I'll have to apply the Peter bleakly limit in a second, Jane. Absolutely. Um, we we tend to um, have to stress that, yeah, but, the, but they are a good person. This isn't about if you're a good person. If doing his job, what we are asking him to do is to act and then we will we, we can make assessment from there. What has he actually what's he actually doing? So there's lots and lots of good people throughout the world in churches and not in churches throughout the world who are doing lots and lots of good things. I respectfully and lovingly suggest it's not really relevant. We believe what you do and not what you say. You can be the nicest possible guy in the world and still be part of a huge problem. Thank you, Jane. I just want to throw a quick quote in and I want to throw it back to Peter. Um, so a quote from that article that's currently on screen. Uh, Detective Chief Inspector Dave Johnson, head of Bristol uh, CID, said, We had no cooperation whatsoever from the Mormon Church. They refused to give us records voluntarily and indicated that if there was any attempt to obtain them, they would vociferously defend any legal action that we took. So that's what I was saying earlier. I don't want that to ever be thrown out as saying, Oh, that was just libelous. No, there's the quote. That's what the newspaper article says. Um, whereas when you go to the um, article, the first article, so let me uh, throw that back up on screen. Hang on, I've got too many things to juggle here. Uh, so we're going to throw that back up on screen. Uh, this is the initial article when the inquiry first starts. And what you've got from uh, Clive Jones there is saying that we'll help. Um, unaware of any incident, the church will offer whatever help it can to bring, to just, uh, bring it, to, it to a just and speedy conclusion. So they initially started by saying we'll do whatever we can to help. And then they said we will um, defend any legal action vociferously uh, in the, the later. Uh, we will not hand anything over voluntarily, those records. So there's that's how things progressed over the course of the two years. Uh, Peter, can you wrap up your point about the civil war in Mormonism real quick for me? Yeah, well, that's the, um, you know, and I absolutely agree with everything Jane says. They've got to walk the walk. And he is, of course, now a figurehead in a, in a church that systemically um is a, a appalling you know where the law forces it to disclose and be cooperative with legal systems they sort of have that attitude but wherever they can get away with not doing so and the advice even in the general handbook is that our people do not go to court we won't allow our bishops to or recommend that they don't appear as witnesses in cases which is terrible because they might be the person that the abuse was disclosed to. And we, we already know of countless cases that got sabotaged by the bishops being told by the church's lawyers not to, to say what they know. Um, it's appalling. Um, so I absolutely agree. So the reason I think all, everything I'm saying where I say the church is worth trying to save or there are better people, it's a work in progress. Um, and ultimately, none of these people are trained. No one ever sat Patrick Kieran down as a state president in the 80s and 90s and gave him proper safeguarding training or how to be a minister training or counselling training or anything of the kind. So the fact that he has got from, you know, understanding the general message of the scriptures that you should be nice to people, that clearly he has worked hard in his ministry. And there are cases where He's been an advocate for people who've been victims of the system being wrong or stupid things being done and said. Um, that That is really positive. The most powerful thing he has, and I don't know if, you know, let's get to it now, um, mm -hmm. is that his voice. And as a 70, as a 70, when he doesn't know he's going to become uh, an apostle, this could be the only shot he gets. It's very rare with so many gen uh, 70s to even have an opportunity to speak in general conference. And the two that really stand out were absolute game-changing powerhouses. Mm -hmm. He moved the dial significantly. The first was about refugees. And this was at the height of the hysteria in America, particularly among Republicans supporting Trump, wanting to build a wall across Mexico to keep the dangerous drug dealing, you know, whatever cartel Mexicans That's what they called them, they just so you them. don't get accused of being racist. And, Thank you. Yeah. And, and yeah. And all and all of us who have served with Utah 
Americans as missionaries know they have endemic racism against Mexicans. And That's we're off the air. Or soon. <laughs> um, and, and certainly in the past, um, that they are seen as, you know, for all kinds of reasons, secular citizens. Or calling them Lamanites them and whatnot. Is... Um, well, that helpful. as well. But, but, but more, no, but more like actual racism. I don't know, right. you know, maybe it was. More I can't speak to, to that. In the deep south for legal reasons, serving. I'm going to yeah. recuse myself from this um, discussion. Yeah. Um, but so in the height of that hysteria, Patrick Kieran gets up in general conference in the middle of Utah tells everyone to remember that the Mormons were refugees, reminds them cheekily that when they went to Utah, it was in actual effing Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the best mic drop moments ever in, in general conference history because they were literally migrants going into Mexico to get freedom. They left the US, their blessed US of A because the USA was not a safe place for them. And um, so he did that, which was extraordinary, and it got rave reviews because he, but also because he wasn't doing general authority voice so much. He was speaking mm -hmm. powerfully, clearly, to the point, addressing an issue head on, which we expect from Jeremy Paxton. Can I just ask you to speak to Anthony night. Campbell here? This is how we do it. Yeah. Says, now all Americans hate Hispanic <laughs> people. Please tell him that's not what you're saying. No, no, no. That's... No, no, no. No, just the, just the Utahns. And um, so... And then his next talk. <laughs> no, I spent, I've witnessed a lot of racism about the Latinos, and yeah. you can't say that's not real. I'm, I'm not. I'm um, not. Yeah. Um, and the um, and also then to follow that up um, on the, literally the thirtieth anniversary of Richard G. Scott's appalling talk in 92, I think, mm -hmm. when he said that people who are victims of abuse should search their conscience to appreciate what level of responsibility they have for the abuse that happened to them and go and meet with their priesthood leaders to determine their guilt. You're muted, Jane. Sorry, could I jump in, Peter, just to ask I mean, a, a really quick yeah. question before before you move away from that point? So what if I were to yeah. put it to you? Um, again, I say this because I really, really, everybody loves the guy. Um, we, we get this. Mm. But um, what if I were to suggest that you, you remember um, whenever the, the period of time, whenever you're talking about the period of time he gives this talk, there was the big push mm. from the church about refugees and migrants um, and mm. Based yeah. on that, because it was the church's sort of golden, cool PR thing for a really long time. Mm. Well, sorry, suddenly for a very short space of time. Well, well wasn't this the whole a... refugee shtick as well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. What wasn't could, could, was this perhaps just the European? To so this is my point. Well, it, exactly, and and there was a whole thing happening here that is very different otherwise some other things from what's yeah. going on. I mean I'm just so bored of the American discussion because we're we're British and I know it affects us but the um I'm just sick of American you know issues controlling my life um in this church and out with it I'm I'm just curious you know like you're you're picking the cool things that you know are going to be crowd pleasers are you giving a talk because it actually means something to you or you know, I mean yeah it was groundbreaking but yeah you're... well I'm gonna I'm gonna take the well, Haney well, the Haney hmm. point for I'll let Peter respond there because I am the boss and this is all about me. Uh, I'm going to take the, the Alan D. Haney point of view, which is that Richard G. Scott's dead, Patrick Kieran's alive, so therefore whatever Patrick Kieran says trumps whatever Richard G. Scott said because Richard G. Scott's words did not age or increase in value like classic cars and comic books. So therefore, um, it doesn't matter if yeah. Kieran means it, he said it, which means it's now more mm. important than... It's now overturned what Scott said. Um, what it hasn't done is apologise for what Scott said, but, you know, the church doesn't apologise. Peter? Well, but, but and there's no way this wasn't intentional. It was exactly the 30th anniversary. It was the October General Conference. And he very specifically undid the specific things that Scott had said. He said, you are not responsible. And he said specifically, whether you think so, or, or if anyone else has told you that you have responsibility, by which I'm sure he meant that idiot apostle who told you to feel guilty and go to your, your priesthood leader. He said, if anyone has told you that you are responsible, you are not. 
Now that is a cleansing moment. That is a baptism of fire. That is setting fire to a whole decades of messaging from Miracle of Forgiveness say sorry. from Spence W. Kimball from several prophets. Well, he didn't have the authority to say sorry. That's not for him to say. Well, he's he doesn't have if that. If we're going to take this, but if we're going to take this as the church's did, new yeah. stance and and view it as washing away the old yeah. stance, then surely it has to come yeah. from someone who has the authority to then apologise. Oh, ob- stance. otherwise I, I can't. I mean, wash obviously, it away. then is yes, yeah, and you know I agree with that. Obviously, mm-hmm. they're yeah. failing across the board. Mm-hmm. But if the dude has twenty minutes or fifteen minutes in general mm-hmm. conference, and it might be the last general conference talk he ever gives, as far as he knows. That's what he chose to do with it. And with that and the refugees, this is the role of the Europeans. This is the role of people not from the Utah bubble. They can see the dysfunctions wrecking this church. Uchtdorf did all along. He did it subtly, but he every year he dropped a truth bomb. He addressed directly the things that all his colleagues were ignoring. And he spoke the words. He said there are good reasons for people to leave the church. He said our leaders have sinned, effectively. He said that, um, thank you, I look like James. Um, He said that, you know, all these things that we've latched onto and gave us hope, but they did change the narrative and they gave people a voice. They spoke for the members of the church who know that all the rest of this stuff is absolute nonsense. So that's my point is you can't change an institution overnight, but the, he and Carrier have gone far out on a limb every chance they've got recently to mm-hmm. to put on the record the, the religion as it should be. And in direct contradiction, obvious, blatant contradiction to what else has been taught from that pulpit, I think that is incredibly courageous. And that is worth a lot because it then gives us stuff to quote. It empowers all the members of the church to say in this general conference talk, this inclusive stuff about LGBTQ people was said. This was said about refugees. This was said about abuse victims. Mm -hmm. And so what within a totally dysfunctional system with all the flaws that I totally agree with and spend hours campaigning about every week, um, I, the, these people are the best we've got at the moment in this broken system until mm. we all vote opposed and get rid of them or replace the other ones. Well, can but I add, they, can I throw something in there? My point is, you can, your voice, like we do, your one voice can change the church mm-hmm. yeah. and we need to cheer them on when they do. Yeah. Well, th- this is why I, I point out here that James E. Talmadge was, um, was the last time we had a British a, a apostle ordained the 8th of december 1911 and and we'll come to the old idea that patrick's already been ordained and and that we haven't had a chance to sustain him yet and it's all backwards and wrong yeah. but one of the reasons why i think it's really important to celebrate the steps he's done because i, I totally appreciate your point peter and i agree with it that he saw that his individual voice might make a difference and that he can choose to use his 20 minutes in conference to address that and i applaud him for that and he did that at a time when he didn't expect he would have the power to represent the institution and apologize and whatnot. He's speaking on its largest stage, um, but he doesn't quite have the same impact as a prophet or apostle. What I want to do now is bring all this stuff to the forefront of everyone's mind. Not just to go, oh, isn't Patrick Kieran brilliant? But right, he's in the seats of power now. He's inside the circus he's inside the top levels of of power within the church so let's watch and cheer him on and see if the things that he says are so important and the things that he is talking about and using his 20 minutes to to talk about see what he actually does now to make those things a reality see what he does now in his position he's only a junior apostle at the moment but see what he does now and what he does further on through his career and possibly even into being the prophet because he's quite young. Let's see what he does. Does not says. Let's see if the church starts changing its stance on abuse and starts making it more difficult for abusers to operate within the church. Let's see if the church starts to become more tolerant and less racist. Let's see if all these things, right? Because that's clearly his vision and his aim according to what he's saying. And I want that to be on the forefront of everyone's mind so that we can cheer him on and champion him to actually make that happen. That's my my thought there. 
Do you want to do you want to cover this, Peter? D and C. Okay. So the frustration, though, is he doesn't have any authority whatsoever, and he isn't an apostle because yes. Doctrine and Covenants <laughs> section twenty sixty five says no person is to be ordained to any office in this church any where there is a regularly organized branch of the same there are definitely organized branches of the church everywhere now without a vote of that church so again you can't be ordained without a vote which implies the vote has to happen first mm. obviously um now some people will weasel out of this because the first presidencies appoint and ordain themselves in secret and here we've gotten a rare example these days of an apostle being ordained again chosen in secret without any vote of the membership the last time was Jeffrey R. Afterwards. Holland in the late 90s yeah didn't that go well um, <laughs> and so there's lots of questions about why they're rushing it there's probably going to be more people dying soon and so on now so the main apologetic excuse given is well the the next two verses here that the you know that the a high priesthood quorum can appoint a leader, but again the, that doesn't work because of that caveat that well if there is if you can have a conference and there are regular organised branches there must be the vote. So the next two verses are but the presiding elders travel and this is the early days of the church where there weren't many organized congregations but the presiding elders traveling bishops high counselors high priests and elders may have the privilege of ordaining where there is no branch of the church that a vote may be called and the implication there is ordaining people lesser people to priesthood like ordaining a an Aaronic priest or a Melchizedek, mm -hmm. an elder or something. Not them being ordained as the ultimate apostle in the church. You know, it's about them traveling around organizing little branches and congregations and ordaining them without a vote. It's if like there where no there isn't a vote. branch yet, um, then we'll do it ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Every president of the high priesthood or presiding elder, which would be like first presidency level back then, bishop, high counselor, and high priest is to be ordained by the direction of a high council or general conference. Um, and they try and take that in isolation. But the whole context there, particularly from 65, is no one is to be ordained without a vote. And the thing that really I just find so weird and frustrating, um, because my stake just had state conference and they retrospectively sustained people who'd already been ordained as elders because the general handbook now allows that caveat. And I think that's outrageous. There's no need for that. They can send high councillors to every ward to, to organise the voting. They do this for various state callings. You know, on this Sunday, everyone will vote in their wards about uh, someone being called as an elder. There's no need to do any retrospective voting. Also, why could not, on that, that Sunday, they decided to appoint Kieran, why can't just every bishop in every ward in the church just get the email right today you're voting for or against patrick kieran being the next apostle we mm. can all vote um or wait till the general conference um the norm is that uh people are announced sustained at general conference as an apostle and then they get ordained the thursday after and a little story with that which may become relevant with kieran's destiny is that um, Uchtdorf and Bednar were both ordained on the same Thursday and Uchtdorf was ordained a few minutes earlier. So he has ranking seniority, which means he will be president of the church if he's still alive before the long-expected Bednar Hang on. regime. Why am I putting my hand up on my own podcast? Can I add to that, Peter? <laughs> go on. Well, yeah, go on. Someone... Uh... Uh, J Jeremy Smith in the comments saying spirit of the law not letter of the law um, and Jeremy's you know, been rather outraged that I dared cut you off there Peter um, and, but I will continue to cut you off Thank because you. this is how we roll um, it's not for love of what it's not for lack of love of what you say Peter it's for timekeeping purposes uh, amongst other things okay. and I just like the sound of my own mm. voice more anyway uh, so but what's interesting is when it comes to the minutiae of like what you said with uh, Bednar and Uchtdorf, that because Uchtdorf was ordained minutes before Bednar, he ranks in seniority. That's very much letter of the law. But yet when it comes to the letter of the law in D&C here, then, oh no, it's, it's the it spirit completely. of the law. We'll just ignore it. What? Yeah. 
doesn't so work. So they just, they just pick and choose uh, whenever they like. You know, if the one thing... The one thing this church can still do, they can't make scripture because they haven't for a century. They can't have prophesy the future. They can't raise the dead or heal the sick anymore. They've given up on all of these things. The one thing they do brilliantly is bureaucracy. The idea that we couldn't organize a worldwide vote about an apostle mm-hmm. in nanoseconds if we had to is ludicrous. Um, and it does say here, you know, under the direction of a high council or, or that this is high every president of the high priesthood bishop high you know senior people is to be ordained under the direction of a high council or general conference Mm -hmm. you could do a general conference online just hook everyone up to the internet if you can't wait really but anyway my point about this story with uchtdorf and bednar is if you we know that there are factions within the leadership of the church you have the conservative and you have the liberal James Talmage, um, you know, even his Wikipedia page talks about how he was trying to negotiate peace between B.H. Roberts, who was educated and scientific and knew that evolution was real, and Joseph Fielding Smith, who was publishing books condemning evolution as a satanic apostasy and wanting it in the church curriculum lessons. And Talmage, as a scientist, was kind of caught in the middle. Um, So... It was clear, really, you could say, that when Uchtdorf and Bednar were called, they were both representing different factions. You've got Uchtdorf, the forward-thinking, liberal, open-minded, honest person who talks about transparency, and then Bednar, who's who's like Goebbels or mini Hitler or whatever, who's a complete control (laughs) freak. Um, And you can see them having, in a sense, representing those factions. You know, all right, we'll let you have Uchtdorf if we can have Bednar. Mm -hmm. And it's highly likely some kind of deal like that emerged in the deliberations. Um, so we can fully, we were fully expecting one of the headbanger control freaks like Ahmed Corbett or Kevin Pearson mm-hmm. to be a yeah. high contender. I thought um, it was going to be for Corbett. Apostle. Yeah, but he'll probably be next. So my point is, we will end up with another rivalry of people who are, who were are ordained at a similar time, okay. and whether which one gets to be president will be headline news. Is mm-hmm. it going to be the liberal forward thinking one or the headbang conservative? And and so look out. My prediction is the next one's going to be representing very much the Jane? control freak faction, um, and the two will become rivals. And then we're going to go to DNC. The power okay. struggle continues. Yeah. Um. So we've kind of, um, as I, I guess, a, a membership of the church and uh, ex-members of the church, we've turned um, Elder Kieran into the safeguarding guy, the the, the safeguarding apostle, um, because it seems to mean something to him. And I really genuinely believe that. And I, I think because he understands and has experienced um, the fact that this is a huge problem. This is why people are leaving the church. He's seen it in action and he needs to sort of create some some clear statements around that. So he is the the perfect guy to, to have called, no question. Um, one of the difficulties is though, um, and... and and I have to say, I, I, we we say these things all the time. You know, we we we're all, we focus a lot on this, you know, this ordination issue. But the other really important thing, and I know we've mentioned it before, but it's worth hitting on again right now. Um, when the church legal team gave evidence to UK's independent inquiry into child sexual abuse in uh, in twenty twenty two. The church legal team made it clear that the process of sustaining or ordination, um, you know, before ordination, is one of the safeguarding procedures that the church has to keep people safe because that name is presented before congregations so that congregations have the opportunity to say no. And it's this this wonderful, you know, if, if we're we're thinking about um what it's actually like being a member of the church and you're being called to use your voice and with one voice the church is going to speak and you know this this sort of very unified moment the church isn't always unified about stuff and and I think it would be here because if someone presents a name and there has to be an objection to it in the same way as someone you know if, if, if you're getting married in the UK and does 
anyone here have cause to object? That's that's what's being asked in that moment. And that was what was sort of being presented in, in the ex-inquiry. You are given an opportunity as a member of the church uh, to, to not sustain or even to lodge an opposing vote. Now, if the safeguarding, um, the king of safeguarding and, and the apostleship here hasn't been subject to that then we've really there's a bit of a gap there between what you say and what you do not necessarily caring yourself but in the, the in church procedures yeah. and we would love to highlight that and see that continue so actually using those laws and implementing them i just want to appeal to the doctrine and covenants student manual uh which is you know the my favorite book ever uh, it's not, uh, but it is a very useful book because someone somewhere in an office in Salt Lake created new church doctrine when they wrote it. Um, this isn't attributed to anyone, um, but it says not only are church officers sustained by common consent, but this same principle operates for policies, major decisions, acceptance of new scripture and other things that affect the lives of the saints. See D&C 26 too. Um, but it talks here about could a person hold an office in the church without the consent of the people that is the question dnc 26 2. no man can preside in this church in any capacity without the consent of the people the lord has placed upon us the responsibility of sustaining by vote those who are called to various positions of responsibility no man should the people decide to the contrary could preside over any body of latter-day saints in this church and yet it is not the right of the people to nominate to choose for that is the right of the priesthood so we don't get to choose who's put in front of us but if we say no we say no and the point is he wasn't put in front of us so according to this doctrine and covenant student manual from you know when i was in seminary and whatnot a couple of years ago a couple of years ago not that old still got it lovely pristine <laughs> This could be yours. No, it can't. It's mine. For reference, threw it on the floor. Uh, that book very clearly backs up what we were pointing to in that scripture by saying that he should absolutely have had a sustaining vote before he was ordained as an apostle. And I think, thank you very much, Anthony Campbell. By the way, we've really enjoyed your um, contributions. Thank you. Um, yeah. The church, all its own... Hi, uh, handbooks, guidelines, scriptures say that this wasn't done in the correct order and we really need to have that known. Um, so I do not, I will say this, I do not recognise the authority of Patrick Kieran as an apostle or as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. Yeah. Um, and, it, and I don't necessarily agree with the idea that it could even be ratified after the fact, but certainly until April, there there is only 11 in that quorum as far as I'm concerned. So great Patrick, you're a great guy. Um, I hope you're not speeding anymore, but you're being driven everywhere, so you probably aren't. Um, but all the primary sources, I'm going to put as many of the primary sources as I can down in the link, uh, in the links in the description. And if not, they'll be written as citations. So you would be able to go up, go look up the Bristol Evening Post and whatever date that was, so that you can see the speeding fine or, or the church abuse scandal or whatever it was. Um, this is the perks of coming to Brits to talk about the new British Apostle. We can look at our own old newspapers and isn't that awesome? Um, make sure you go check out 21st Century Saints in the link below. They're gonna go live straight after we're done here. Check out Peter. Um, there were some of you in the chat that wanted Peter to just keep going and going. I want Peter to just keep going and going sometimes, but alas, we only <laughs> have an hour. Be careful what you wish for. So if you want three hours of Peter just talking and talking and talking, you can go to his podcast and listen to all of his wonderful, uh, excellent takes. Um, Jane? And quick spoiler alert, just so that you guys know, lovingly, we're going to be giving tonight on the show as we uh, review, we're going to kick off phase two of the safeguarding uh, project that we launched last year. We're also giving some Brit Vengers into a little bit of trouble. We're going to hold some Brit Vengers to count tonight in a loving and very, very fun way. So come right. and join us if you want. Yeah, yeah, you two getting your asses kicked is going to be fun. Come and join us. We're not going um, to so yeah, um, see, see you just shortly. I'm going to get rid of that link in the description. Don't go and watch that. That's This is, sounds slanderous. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Make sure you like on your way out. Subscribe if you want to see more of these things. Uh, and for the first time this year, Merry Christmas to all of you. Take care. Merry Christmas. Bye now. Happy Christmas.